legend and icon, singer, DJ and songwriter Angie Brown was hailed at the start of her career as Britain's answer to Tina Turner. Born to Jamaican parents who arrived in the UK as part of the Windrush generation, Angie is the daughter of extraordinary resilience, enterprise and ingenuity. Powerhouse as a singer and powerhouse as a person, Angie Brown forged her own phenomenal career, achieving cult status both in the UK club scene and abroad, including the United States. Classed as veritable house music royalty at festivals, including Pride festivals throughout the world, she is described as a voice that is only matched by her powerful personality. Trained with world-class West End performer and top vocal coach Annette Battens, Angie developed her incredible gift, enabling her to sing just about anything. She's turned her talent to multiple genres, working with world-class legends such as Rolling Stones musicians Ronnie Wood and Keith Richards. She's sung with Grace Jones, Beverly Knight, Mark Morrison, Kate Bush, Shaka Khan, Heaven 17, Nina Cherry, Lisa Stansfield, The Stereophonics and Fatboy Slim to name but a few. Her career exploded when she sang as lead singer for the 90s Bizarre Inc. hit I'm Gonna Get You. She's collaborated with DJs including DJ Dougal and the producer of Prodigy, Ollie Jacobs, with whom she has now created her latest chart-topping single, Higher. Angie Brown has juggled motherhood with career and is a force of nature. Her love for people, her passion for her art and her unique ability to connect and communicate have seen her further hone her expert and versatile skill set as a DJ with a difference, lighting up the lives of so many during lockdown with her energy, great tunes and unique voice on air. Angie Brown was not only born to sing, she lights up not just the stage, but the lives of all those with whom she comes into contact as an inspiration through her relentless positivity, gratitude, energy, and ability to share with others. I'm Sarah Barnes and I connect with great people and great minds. I explore life stories and I look at how lives impact on mindsets and mindsets impact on lives. I'm here with the legendary Angie Brown, amazing singer, and she has an absolutely fascinating life story, but she also has a brilliant attitude. There are a lot of people who'd be described as having a glass that's half full or three quarters full. But anyone who meets Angie Brown knows that she's someone whose glass is definitely overflowing. And so I'm really, really curious to explore today her life story and also to find out about her new single um, and to just, yeah, find out more. Hi, Angie. Hi, darling. Hello, Sarah. And hi to all the listeners or watchers out there. Thank you for tuning in. Oh, that's absolutely brilliant to be speaking to you. Now, house music, Angie, I think most people would say that they know what house music is, but we don't necessarily know exactly where it comes from. Can you tell me something about that? Because it's quite an interesting story, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. Well, basically, right, with music, you can't, there's no way, it's not, it's, 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 it's a commodity, actually one of our biggest exports ever you know like when you look at queen and elton john and david bowie we've got music is one of the biggest ex exports in this country but um what happens is um in the late 80s early 90s people just creative people got tired of trying to get a record deal through a main a mainstream record company you know yeah and once people learn how to make their own dub plates which is the the dub plate is the the first cut record that you print all the other records. Once it stopped being like, you know how big companies monopolize on everything and it's all like a, a, a secret. Once the once the general man in the street knew how to make his own dub plates and businesses started, um, you know, doing 
um, promoters and um, producers started doing um, independent deals, yeah. right? But basically, uh, the, these pressing houses, basically, the house music started. It started in your mom's front room, in your nan's garage. And same with garage. It's a sound that came about from the people. So literal, and, literally house music, literally coming out of people's houses. Literally. And it came from America, just a little bit of history about it. It came from Chicago. And it was really uh, like like a bit of a gospel vocalist singing over the top of something. And it could be, you know, hallelujah anyway, or it could be, um, uh, you know, anything, any like hands in the air kind of, you know, I believe and all of this stuff. And it was just random singers that were on a dub plate and they put a little beat behind it which was a little bit faster than uh disco yeah. and it gave gave it this drive a massive and, energy yeah in america i mean it's documented they tried to kill disco at one time <laughs> and this guy, this really right wing really racist guy was like put a stop to disco and he got all these people and they, 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 they marched and they went into a football stadium and they broke all the Candy Statins and all this, all this, you know, Michael Jackson and whatever we, we liked, right? Because we, because, um, you know, not everyone was into linking country and rock. And, you know, there's always, there's always a, a little underground movement to try to stop things surging forward. Anyway, what happened was, you know, disco won and then literally it progressed into, house now jocelyn brown somebody else's guy um don't quote me the year but it was maybe 85 86 but with that you know with that big um opening that she she did yeah with that, i can't get off my heart and i just can't let you, whatever she does on that i mean it's phenomenal yeah. and everybody who heard that stopped in their tracks. So we're like, what the hell? Where's she like, you are the one who and it feels like a totally this. new and raw sound. What they did was like because she's more she that track is viewed more as a soul tune. Yeah. What people they started to do once Alan Sugar <laughs> yeah. like, if Lord Sugar did this stereo. And the stereo, like um, even uh, MCs do it, who had an abstract stereo back in the day. Because young people who had a tape, and we all taped Top of the Pops, and we all did the two finger thing. <laughs> and then started doing this tape to tape, tape, uh, cassette to cassette recording. Okay. Came, then they take it to the blinking um, pressing place and do their own records. So, as we spoke about in the past, there was all these independent record shops. So, uh, you know, you had in every in every town. I can't even remember what ours was called. Not Art Nash, but in, in Page, you had a you had a, a, a an independent record shop where you would get American music, like you know, Boogie Nights and stuff like that, and stuff that was out, but it was taking a long time to trickle through. But the soul people was like dying for it. You could you could order it. Well, house went in that way. It was like, dum, 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 dum. so somebody was going, oh, yeah, and all this stuff. And it was really experimental. It didn't really, it didn't really sound that fantastic. But what it did do, house music, with all this rubbish going on in America that I explained to you earlier with them trying to stop disco, yeah. it flat and the gaze tight. Oh my goodness. So I mean and 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 obviously just a real opportunity for people to get creative and express themselves in a new way, which actually is kind of what's been happening a lot I think during COVID actually with in this strange these strange days with people using technology and finding different ways to communicate. So that was I suppose like a birth of something new, a new opportunity as you say for for people to just create new sounds and mix things up in a totally unique way without anyone stopping them. That's right. And that's why, you know, um, a chic and all those kind of sounds, all the, um, you know, the, um, is it Studio 54 and all these places came about because they started mixing disco with house and they started feeding the, the glitzy people, the people who wanted to, you know, transgender people yeah. who, who just didn't fall into line with, you know, so there was know. room for there was room for everyone to come in, no matter what, and express something new. Yeah, 
and it crossed over with with the glitzy and the creative and the artistic and the interesting and it just didn't go away it just didn't go away and the people that got turned away from the normal nightclubs and that because you 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 weren't welcome yeah. you could go to the house night and you could have so much fun even here in the in the uk you know with, um when i've listened to people talk about um northern soul yeah. northern soul for some people up north say you are from a mixed race family you you're the, you know, you might have felt like I'm the only, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm basically politically black, but I, I feel rejected at school. Yeah. I feel unhappy everywhere. You could go to the Northern Soul Club, and nobody cared. Everyone was, yeah, what was. This is a perfect example of when they talk about diversity and actually the real beauty of diversity everybody contributes they're not trying to become uniform nobody's trying to mold everyone in this one way when actually everybody can express themselves and everybody's voice is valid everybody's contribution is valid when you come you that is when real creativity happens and real progress gets made and that's a perfect example isn't it that's right. So the people came together and they created house music for themselves. So they were hungry to put out their own music with their own sound because with the new generation, you're going to get a new feel. Yep. And the Amstrad series, it just gave people this freedom to do these mixtapes. And that's how it happened. And and um, I remember actually when I'm going to get you came out, you had to get you had to sell 40,000 before Woolworths would stock it. Yeah. So you the Nicky Black Market in Soho. You went to this one, Red Records in Brixton. Mm. You went to say, hey, I've got a tune and it's wicked. And then they'd give it a listen. They'd stock, I don't know, 10, 20. And people who wanted that slightly left feel, because a good DJ always wants, you know, some of his set to not be like the next DJ set. Definitely. And so yeah. Way, just like the Blinkins, that soul music, that Northern Soul. If you listen to their stories, they left Wig Wigan, Wigan, mm -hmm. or that type of school, and they flew to America to go and buy these B sides that are doing nothing. Yeah. Come sitting in the club and all all them young people doing all the little line dances they do to Northern Soul. So when music's got a breakthrough, you cannot hold it back. No. And that's what I, yeah, absolutely. And I believe, I mean, later we're going to talk about your single and I believe that's what's going to happen. You cannot hold Angie Brown's next single back, no chance, but we'll wait for that a little bit. <laughs> so before we come to that bit, Angie, um, I want to go back. Obviously, we want to talk about your life story a bit because okay. that's pretty amazing. Now, your parents, they were immigrants during the, the Windrush era and yeah. they came over, I believe, 54, 55 in quite a difficult time. Can you tell me about that? Like what it was like when they arrived? And because I know your mum was like actually an amazing entrepreneur. So just tell us a little bit about that story. Well, uh, for, in the beginning, well, my dad came over. I don't know the name of the ship, but dad came by ship. In 54, mum flew. She's really proud. Hi, line, you buy a ticket. And I, you know, so she flew from Kingston to Newfoundland, Newfoundland to Shannon, Shannon, London, right? Yeah. My dad had been here a year, so she weren't impressed with the food. She weren't impressed with poor daddy because he was still renting. Now, the man probably took him ages to actually find a, a, a landlord that was, uh, you know, not doing the no blacks, no Irish, no yeah. dog. Because um, it was a really tough time still. It was very unwelcoming, you know, despite all the promises. Well, that's why people settled in areas as well, because some areas were more uh, open or probably more liberal than others. So, And was, Bri and was Brixton like that? Was Brixton better? Yeah, and plus you, the areas that they did let you into were quite de deprived. De yeah, yeah, just run. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah, so Notting Hill. I know that Notting Hill is right up there now, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> millionaires it still is and they've, they've still got um you know i mean you wouldn't see that in Notting hill the movie but it's so very that's why the, the festivals the carnivals have held there there's a lot of a lot of roots as far as safety in numbers you know like yeah. when i when my family used to go and visit um someone like my uh first cousin juliet who lives over in white city and that's so it was a big thing oh we're all getting in the car and we're all left all the doors and yeah <laughs> we're entering out of Brixton. Yeah. 
it was such a big thing that we we take for granted now because and you remember i told you about my uncle bert he's the one that used to come up to crystal palace to fight with the teddy boys because he's a little <laughs> that but you know without people i know you know i shouldn't glorify um violence but without people like him say or, or even my mum when i told you my mum used to do the day trips out of brixton I don't know what would have happened because people people needed to feel like, right, we're not going back to Jamaica now. To make so it home, have, to make it... Children, the children are at school and we're going to have to find a way of working together. And in places like Brixton, Stockwell, um, White City, um, Paddington around that area, mm. um, and cities like Birmingham and Coventry where black people settled because they worked in the factories or on the buses or whatever... That's what they did. They, they, you know, it would be a big trip. Yes, we're going to Birmingham for the for, for two nights to go and see another friend that might have, my mum would have known from her parish in Jamaica. So yeah, because she she used to org- organize the trips, didn't she? Organize buses for for groups of you, the family, and friends to all go on. Isn't that right? Out of the area. Because if you only stay in one area, mm. you only that you've got to grow as a person. I think my. People like my mom and my uncle Bert and people like that kind of knew that you like like because all all West Indian people, regardless of what part of the archipelago they come from on all the islands and that, mm. came literally to earn their money for five years and then we're going back, right? Yeah. Because to deal with the racism, they had to deal with the coldness, yeah. post war. So. To them, everything looked grey and cold and... And not it like looked, it had been promised. I mean, it had been promised land and all that, wasn't it? You know, but... Smog here in London and all the chimneys and all the blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and the people were both burning coal fires and everything and and, and paraffin. And, and so they, they weren't happy. They weren't they weren't welcomed because the footage of the, the Pathé news that they watched in the cinemas in Jamaica saying, come to England, you know, uh, even there's one with Enoch Powell even saying it, but then he backpacked and said, oh, it's going to cause rivers of blood or whatever. Oh, gosh, yes. Uh, and, and actually, we've proved him quite wrong. But anyway, the point, the point is, he was pointing out that there were, there were going to be problems along the way. It weren't going to be e- easy to, to, to just... Um, to pick up somebody else's culture or to just get over your racism yeah. and say, look, what you fry your egg like this, but I fry my egg exactly the same, but I might put coconut oil, you know, I might have this salad or this on top of it. But it's, it, it's basically you're a human being and you need to get your head around that I'm a human being as well. And and once, once my mum gathered that people needed to have a good time, people needed to get out of London, people... People up in the, you know, Great Yarmouth or wherever the seaside was, they need to get over it. There's black people living here and people from different diversities. We need that day out of London where we go to the beach. We and, we, we need. To and your mum was a person who who led on that, you know. But the other thing that was very interesting was that I mean, this entrepreneurial side side that your mum had because. The other thing was that it was difficult, wasn't it, financially? You know, hence why I think a lot of those people grouped together. Um, yeah. But it was difficult financially, and she 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 found ways of earning money, didn't she? And she actually bought a property. Yeah, in five, uh, under five years, my mum bought her first property, and so she started to. Um, it was a, a townhouse in Gateley Road, London, and she. Um, it, I think it had about five bedrooms, hmm. so it's a townhouse. So she rented all the rooms and all the other. Spare rooms were either a bathroom or a a, a landing kitchen. You know, it's on a landing and all the you know and all the cooking smells would go. And then and then she said that the old women would say, oh, "I've got my clothes on the landing drying with one of those dryer things." And the, you know, the women would, uh, would 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 might have a little fuss between them, whatever. But um, you know, you had to kind of kind of move side by side until you could get the money, which was normally from a partner, which is kind of almost based on the pyramid thing, but it's not, um, you don't have to bring someone new in. It would be 10 people and they would put down 10 pounds a week. And then that person who, you know, next in line would get that 10 pounds first. And then it would go the second person until everybody over the 10 weeks got their 100 pounds. And then a new partner would start and you would say, right, who's in? And sometimes it would be five, six. Sometimes the partners were 20, 30 people. So definitely, 
that's people working together that's building community and that's an amazing thing and I mean for you you know as a little girl to being born into that kind of I suppose mentality and that kind of determined attitude that's got to somehow subconsciously come across to you hasn't it I mean that that your parents attitude of we will make a way we will achieve our goals I mean I, I can I definitely see that in everything you do Angie People used to come round, like say it was a Friday. I used to see my mum taking all this money. So I, I just got a little, a little cash thing, and she'd put it away. And um, you know, it's only when I was older I thought people only did that because they trust you. And I was gonna, it wasn't a bank, you yeah. know. But I, one, one tea, well, I should say tea thing, but one thieving boy came, um, and he was one of my brother's older friends, mm. and he knew my mum took the money, and one week he went off with the money you know some people are kind of like wrong ones yeah. oh, I see my mom like lose weight have a nosebleed because oh. she did she would do anything to not be um discredited or or not trusted because for her when you trust her and you trust her with your life she ain't gonna take, take, destroy that it meant so much to her being yeah. the old of all her siblings and the parents dying young my parents my, my grandparents died in their 40s so my mum had that responsibility being the oldest person and that's why it it means a lot to her that she is she was respected within the community yeah you know? I mean and he said she even I remember one day my mum said she stopped um one of her lodgers her name was Mel and Mel was pregnant mm. and she cried and she said Mrs Brown um my mum said, what is wrong? And she was crying and she said, I'm, I'm pregnant. Now there was four of them already in the room. Gosh. So I called them Mel, Auntie Mel and Uncle Dickie, and they yeah. had, had Michael and Paul in the room. And we were all toddlers, so we always had, you know, us, the children, are just so not phased by anything. We're being so protected and, and loved within the, within that family home. We, we weren't aware of what people had to deal with. So... Mel was crying, and my mum said, "What is wrong?" She said, "I was pregnant." And she said, "Man, I've got a hundred pounds now. Hundred pounds back then, it must be like five grand now, easily." Yeah. yeah. And she said that she's looking for a back street abortionist. And my mum, bless her, she's a Catholic. She she did turn Church of England as daddy when she met my dad, but her fundamental belief was, "No, no, 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 don't you know, don't get rid of the baby." Especially if my mum did the nurse and she knew that the backstreet abortion is used, the pelt hangers and yeah. implements with knitting needles to to get the, the, the you know the, the uterus to reject the baby. Yeah, so horrific. Mel, of course Mel's gonna think you're gonna fling me on the street. And my mum said, No, I would never do that. She said, How much money you've got? Mel said, I've got hundred pounds. My mum put the hundred pounds in a partner for Mel and Dickie. And then when it came to their hand, I don't know. I don't know the internet of who was the bank manager who helped them to cross that 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 bridge. But she helped Dickie and Mel to buy their first house. That's amazing. That's absolutely incredible. I mean, what what an amazing story. And of course. You know, in terms of how that's impacting on you, the things that you're seeing, that you're learning at a young age about determination, about compassion, about all of those things, I can exactly see how that plays out, I think, in terms of the way that you treat other people, the way that you care about other people and about the way you connect with other people. I can see that. Honestly, that's that's a really beautiful story. Now, you know, you, my mum always taught us that you just give from your heart from here. You don't give to get something back and and I and I saw that in my mum's funeral you know we mentioned that in, you know when I one of our other talks that the outpouring of love I I, I got um quite uh sort of disorientated with it because it felt like everyone was like having a little peck in a nice way going yeah. your mother this and her and if it wasn't for Mrs Brown I'd well the mother be I, I got I got whoa I got I, I got sort of like like a white out with it because I thought Everybody came out to show their respect, and everybody who got hold of me said the same thing. Yeah, well, I mean, she changed lives. She clearly changed lives, you know. And, I mean, another thing that you mentioned as well was when we spoke about school for you. School yeah. for you was a really happy time. And I think, again, that was quite an unusual uh, situation. You described it as a school that made you feel whole. What do you mean yeah. by that? 
because I think like I went to Stockwell Primary School it was literally three three roads away and then when I was five I said to mum there are only that you know little side roads I can do this on my own so I got independent about walking to school very <laughs> independent <laughs> yeah really around the corner so I, I I I I used to do that but when only looking back now as an adult I know that Stockwell Primary School you know, for your fundamental uh, uh, emotional and mental well-being, that school put everything in place for me to be the person that I am today. Because, as you know, as as, as closed off as we can be, and so oh, you know, white people are racist, or the Brits are racist to us. But the people who went to that school were good, open-minded, loving, just. I don't know if it's spiritual, Christian, Christianity or Catholic, whatever it is, they had in their heart for the children. They did their job, irrespective of colour. So I think I mentioned Mr. Shula to you. And you he did. Was, but I couldn't, he's African. That's what it, was, it was totally alone with the rolling of the R's and everything. <laughs> and you don't know. But only when I got old and thought, Mr. Shula was a He left. He could have probably had rolling hills and valleys in his on his land given to him by his great grandfather. But he lived was in in in, in Brixton, South London. He came to 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 tell us about his country and share with us whatever he had to teach us. And so I, it's really hard to to um for me to to have been brought up as a as a racist or a one sided person. You know, and, mm. and and even what was going on right throughout South Africa's history, mm. my did catering. I met Titch Robinson. I met the most amazing people. You have to take people as that individual. You can't say everybody is like you know racist, horrible, bad. Wants to put the black man. Down. No, it, exactly it's, because I think everybody's into kind of like labeling people all the time and trying to put people into brackets. But everybody's unique. We all have our influences, different influences, and those are, can be our like our life influences, our cultural influences. There's so many things that go into making that absolutely unique person that everybody is. And you're right. We have to see the person before us and find out about that person before us. And only when we do that, just like with the house music, only when we do that and we start, you know, allowing people to be themselves wholly and to contribute what they've got uniquely to give and to hear their voice and properly hear those and want to hear their voice. Yeah. You know, that that that's where we need to get to, isn't it? And and that's that's how you kind of described that you felt back then actually. Yeah, and that, um I mean you know, I, I'm painting a really lovely picture, but you know, there, there, there was grey days, there was darkness as well, because mm. um, you know, my mum also got unlucky with a couple of um, lodgers one time, and they thought they'd take the house from her, and it was that got really that was sad for me because I was a child and I wanted to protect her, and there was this lodger who wouldn't get out, and my mum had her when nobody else would have her. Actually, I think my mum was warned about her, and then she. Well, she she should try and take my mum's house and you become a sitting tenant and it just you know again and, I, I mean and mom, you know. how did your mum take it though because I mean obviously that seems to be really a clear memory for you so when your mum was having this bad experience and you clearly knew that that was a difficult thing for her how did she cope with it what did she how did she kind of go past that I mean I don't think my mum didn't probably read one of the psalms every day she 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 wrote down everything that um the soldier said she was going to do to us you know at one time she said we're going to burn down the house because sometimes you meet people who hate you because you're successful yes or they that you've got sense and sensibility or that you've got the ability even though you're helping them mm. or you you put out the knowledge grants to them that isn't enough they want what you've got and what you've got is your god-given gift right mm. and my mm. He took this woman in when everyone was saying, oh, she's trouble, she's trouble. Mm. And she was younger than my mum and she tried to entice the men in the house and even my father, to be honest, you know. And and, and um, she was just scheming to, to, to get my mum's, you know, everything that my mum had uh, uh, worked for. So, mm. you know, as a child, I can't, I can't remember all of it, but it really did 
Oh God. Uh, oh. It really, it really upset me because I couldn't do anything about it. Mm. I couldn't do it when she came out of the room and she started on my mum because because I was little, and and you know I remember her chucking a a big bucket of urine all over my mum one day. Oh my gosh. Humiliating mummy, yeah. and I just couldn't do anything about it because until you know there was a, 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 a you know a, a, the sunshine did come out one day because sometimes when you're doing the backwards and forwards things with the letters and stuff like that and and, and um I knew that when my mum got into court it was going to be over mm. and that's a, the I can't remember how long the court case was it's probably a couple of weeks mm. or couple of days but the judge just went you know we did the ruling you know please yeah. you know mrs brown you've got you know two weeks yeah. to find new but, abode. I, but i guess the point is though is that actually you did see that you know not everything was rosy you saw that your mum was going through difficult times but you saw that your mum had ways of coping with that and you saw that your mum persevered through it which again i think probably is a lesson you take on board. You've seen, your eyes have been opened. Look, it's, I've got this loving atmosphere that's making me feel secure, mm. but not everything is rosy, but you can get through it. And that's, I guess, the attitude that you obviously saw. And whilst it still hurts, you know, that, that kind of determination, that has to have an impact on you, doesn't it? It does. And when I was a lot older, me and mum talked about it and we cried mm. because I wanted to pick her up. You know, I wanted to... Uh, you know, I'd like to chuck a bucket of urine on her. Do you mm. know what I mean? But you, you, and when you were a kid as well back then, you was you had to see and not say anything. You had to. You're a child. You don't get involved with, you know, big people's business. You don't. You had to. We had to still, you know, me and Leon still had to talk to her like she was the nicest person on earth because my mum said it was her battle with her with with this lodger. Gosh. And, and uh, uh, but if you were fuming inside because you just seen this wonderful woman mm. being. T- to shreds it mm. and it, it was a that was a sad time and then um, you know my mum my at the end of it my mum took off to America just for a few months to see if she liked she, you know she thought about new beginnings for us but she, she my mum didn't settle in America and mm. I think that you know I'm not I'm not saying that um I'm not putting myself down but I'm emo- that's where my emotional eating came came into play because you know I'm not no skinny mini I'm you know size 16 to 18 but um you know when you're going through your teens and 20s and you just yeah. feel you know I think when you're older you just accept yourself for how you are and you just and um we've all seen it how women are on television saying yes we can do it the, love us how we are curly hair straight hair big small stop compartmentalizing people to be whatever yeah zero whatever well the, you know with that really being when my mum went away I became both me and my brother became emotional eaters because we didn't know when she was coming back it wasn't Gosh. like yeah. now you guys and you go it was so expensive to use the phone back yeah. then you got whatsapp we just we knew she was coming back we just didn't know when and that's and my uncle in Herne Hill so Herne Hill is about a mile away from from Brixton mm. depending on what where you are but and uh, but and we had lovely times there as well because my cousins my uncle upstairs my mm. my dad's sister lived upstairs in this big house in Coxton Road and we had so much fun but me and Leo we were overeating because we wanted our mum Yes. Yeah, well, your mum's your mum, isn't it? And when a mum when a mum disappears uh, in, during your formative years, that's a really tough thing. And I think, as you say, you know, life's a journey, and you have to find you find your various sort of coping mechanisms, and you have to work through those things. You begin to understand, and that's why I think self awareness and beginning to understand yourself and understand what you need and how you tick is so important, isn't it? Liberty, because another thing, what well, you know, I teach my boys now. I would say, yeah, you know, because they're teenagers, they can get a bit greedy. I know they can <laughs> fry eggs, bacon, a big Scooby snack. And I say to the boys, that's fine. But, you know, Charlie's body shape, he's quite tall and thin. He's, he's not a problem. But Cuba, Cuba can get a bit podgy. And I just say to him, just don't, 
you can eat like that, but burn it off. I wish I had someone to tell me that because I was just kind of like, you know, oh, less, you can have the, we call it Nestle's milk, but it was Nestle milk. <laughs> And, with, and you have a jam and then you had fried bread you know i mean uh globally the way people eat food has changed as far as you don't have to fry things you can put it in the oven but when we were kids we didn't we didn't know that when we were small children we didn't know and my mum wasn't there to guide us and we were overeating and by the time she'd only been in america three months but mm. by the time if you've laid down those fat cells especially in puberty mm. You know, I've always yo-yoed. There's all different sizes <laughs> online about me. But it's because because you've laid down those fat cells and your body goes, where is it? I want the fat back. And yeah. But you know that you, you've uh, basically, you know, through no fault of your own, caused yourself to have this, this because it feels like a prison. When there's too much weight on, you feel like you're in a prison because you can't go in the shop and buy what you want and, blah 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 you know you go to the fun fair and you think oh that that gate thing they shut and squeeze my leg you know it's just there's various things that you think oh I, you know i feel and it can I be can't. a real struggle can't it i mean you know and you've got that struggle and as you say because people compartmentalize people judge on what they see and all that kind of stuff you judge yourself on the messages <laughs> you're getting it you know yeah. it's a really it's, tough thing because fat is the, the the even the most hated prejudice but even more than color fat is like oh you're fat you're fat and i and sometimes i blame it on the fact that my record my my career didn't take off when i was in my 20s because oh you're fat you're not really really swell you know you're not tiny and and um you know I, there was lots of blame about not being attractive and you know not not being very very successful because i was fat but um you know, now I'm older, it comes down to, I know it's destiny and the time was right. Yeah, and I think sometimes sometimes those things, more than anything, I think it's the issues that those things put in our own heads, isn't it? The the issues that form in your own heads in, in, the, in the way that you can be judgmental about yourself and you start to focus entirely on that instead of using your energy to drive yourself forward, you know, in, in perhaps the ways that, that you can do, then that in itself becomes a prison, doesn't it? But you did drive yourself forward phenomenally th throughout. I mean, you spoke about, I think, Lena Zavaroni when you were a child. She was a, a massive inspiration for you. Um, I think on a, on a couple of levels. But one, you said because you sort of saw the things that her music was allowing her to do. And then as an artist, can you tell me about that? I think that when you're a kid and you see Lena Zavaroni on the opportunity now, she's, she's, she's singing that, Mama! He's making eyes at me. Mom, you think nine? How is she doing that massive black voice coming out of a tiny little baby girl? And then she was, um, you know, she was doing the paper a lot and she was with the Pope and then she was with Frank Sinatra. So doing everything, literally taking her all around the world, basically. I was like, I want that to be you. You know, but you don't. You know, when you're a kid, you don't realise that having a happy childhood means that you're at home with your parents and you're getting, you're having a normal life because you're not, you're not having those pressures put on you when <clears throat> you don't. We don't understand what being a child star. Well, I don't understand what being a child star is like because they, they, they you know, it's not as easy as it looks. Or, you know, the parents of of, of 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 known Hollywood people or people who've been in sitcoms. It, uh, sitcom, sorry, they all have to deal with 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 jealousies from outside. Oh, my son's better than yours. He's rubbish. They deal with so much, and, and and already having to be a certain way, and and being yeah. conscious of how they look in the cameras and stuff. You know, all the time, it's a, a really huge pressure, isn't it? It was. It was, and, and the bit, books that I've, I read about Shirley Temple's life, mm. and you know, because I, you know, growing up, you you. She was like a little hero as well because she was cute, and I think because she she would be dancing with the Bo, Mr. Bojangles and the the black people on the plantation or whatever. It's like, oh, there's a black man in the movie, and then there's two black guys doing the tap dance or whatever, and the uh, you know you 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 appreciate things yeah. about an a uh, 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 an actress or an artist like that, but you don't you know not till I read the book did I know that what her mum had to go through to. To, to to you know to keep her daughter on the straight and narrow and 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 to to yeah. keep her uh, safe 
gosh. And now, but nevertheless, it was an inspiration for you. And then you said that when you went to secondary school, you know, you found you weren't able to kind of use your artistic energies, which were coming out in slightly the wrong way at school. <laughs> um, so you went and found for yourself, you went and found um, a Saturday drama school or a, a, a musical theatre school. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. I used to go to a Saturday school in Croydon and that was that was good that was the every 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 Saturday between sort of like midday and three in the afternoon uh, and there's a couple of people that went there they're in tv now and all sorts and then um so that was 18 I went to St Catherine's drama school and that was a private drama school and I went there for just under a year it was a two-year course I must admit it was a two-year course but I didn't I, did, I, I think I had that realization that um you know, the teacher that, that again, she's not going to get me. She's not going to get that I've got this booming voice. She's going to want me because it was almost run by a sole trader and it was her. She went to RADA and yes. been in movies with, you know, Sir Lawrence or whatever. And um, and I thought, I'm not going to, I'm not going to fit in here either. So yeah. I left after nine months and I just concentrated. So this was like full time drama school by this stage, wasn't it? Yeah, because I was living in Guildford and staying at Lorraine Eaton's house. I lived in Dunstold, which is 10 miles outside of Guildford. But you wake up in the morning, there'll be deer on the common. You're like, what? You know, you fall in a ditch and be covered with nettles, you know, coming from Brixton. I was like, what the hell? What, what's going on? Gosh, but, uh, yeah. I, was, I guess it was like my the equivalent of when you go to uni and you're away from home and stuff like that. But, um, yeah, the drama school thing. But you discovered that really wasn't exactly you. Now, just before that, I mean, I think there were two things that were really key that we that we actually missed here was that obviously you you'd gone off on some holidays to Butlins back in the day, in the days when Butlins had fantastic real life stages, which gave you that taste for like being on the stage. And then you then I think you'd gone in for the competitions and you decided for yourself that you needed to have um, a really good singing teacher that you really needed to train up that voice. Now, I've got a recording of somebody here um, who is rather special to you. I will never forget. It's a long time ago. She was a young teenager and had been trying to find a singing teacher for quite some time. Her formidable mother was with her and we, she couldn't do scales and all sorts of form, form, form uh, what do we call it, the, the sort of typical singing les lesson stuff she didn't respond to. And she, I, I realized that she was unusual and very sweet and, and very full of uh, willingness and, and uh, courage. Anyway, I said, what song do you know? Do you know any songs? And she said, yes, I know Brown Skin Girl. <laughs> we proceeded to try this key, that key, and I tried a lower key. Nah, I, I tried a key somewhere around the upper middle voice. And it was like a light switched on. That girl just sparkled. And I, I immediately knew that she was dynamite. Marvelous talent. And Mama was sitting there pretending to read The Guardian. <laughs> and she liked it too. They, it was a memorable meeting. <laughs> now, described you as she knew that that girl was dynamite. Of course, that was the... And she, she still is, obviously, the amazing Nettie, Annette Battams. Can you yeah. tell me about her? Because cause you found her for yourself. Just, oh, my gosh. I couldn't believe it. It was some, you know, just um, I'm a working class girl. So to go to someone's house and in their front room, remember my mum's property has always been rented out to people or fostering children or something. And it was like the lounge. You know, what lounge we did have, that was pristine. And that was for when the social workers came around. So leave it, <laughs> leave it clean up. <laughs> every cushion, every little doily, you know, black people had those doilies. Yeah. Anyway, and there's the glass fish and the, the whole thing. <laughs> Bloody. 
access to go to, to someone's house and she quite randomly got a grand piano in the front room. Amazing. <laughs> Because I mean, she was a she was a big West End star, and and she she you know she was a top top vocal coach, and you found her for yourself, and went and auditioned to study with her. And as she described you, she said you're she knew that you were special. She knew that you were dynamite. What was it like to study with her? What was that like? Oh, she's amazing. She, I was in awe of Letty because she taught Lena Zavaroni for a little bit when she wow. uh, in Clapham and. Italia Conte from where Nettie lived in Chelsea Road. Italia Conte was literally across the past the tube station, and you're at Italia Conte. Wow. So she teach, she did used to teach Lena Zavaroni, but she, um, you know, she just decided to teach at home because it was it was easier. But um, once I once I found her um, through the Yellow Pages, through uh, uh, some other musicians, because it didn't have any vocal coaches listed. Mm. I just got a little bit annoyed and said to this, um, to this uh, I think it was a violinist, I just said, oh, you wouldn't, you wouldn't happen to know, the, you know, the number of a good a good vocal teacher in, in London. And she said, she's like, you know, this is worlds apart. You can tell the number of your life. I'm from London, no, no. He's like, oh, yes, yeah. so I can give you a number. Someone rather remarkable. You bring her, you know, Nettie back. And I rang Nettie and I, and I said, please, I really want to learn how to how to sing, how to make my voice, how you know, have some kind of longevity. I probably didn't say longevity. <laughs> 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 you know, being a professional singer. And she said, you know, do do come, you know, on this day, whatever. And um me and my mum went, really excited I was. And it was I remember Nettie was charging twelve pounds an hour and we couldn't afford them. My mum said, No, no, we can't afford twelve pounds an hour, but that would have so been a I, lot of money. For half an hour for six quid. Gosh. And I just literally, I didn't have a chance to really learn songs that much. It was, more, you know, the technique and, you know, hey, oh, 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 mama, come on and shake it. And we'd go right up the scale, right down again, and ning, 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 and anything to uh, teach me how to get that brightness and reverberate mm. my beat. So I had that, I had that strength. My 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 mum sang in church as a, as a young lady, and people would come to hear that sound so and obviously I, the gift's been passed on <laughs> yeah so I, I i i did it as well and um and basically netty netty knew how to get that sound out of me without damaging my vocal cords or the vocal folds yeah and i and apparently your brother wasn't too impressed is that right <laughs> He took the pee out of the every wig. Yeah, you know, black boys, yeah, he's doing all that flicking. Yeah. He was like, come on, mummy and daddy, wasting up their money, yes, and. <laughs> <laughs> them. And, I, and I used to be going, you know, doing my doing it, and just, and, <laughs> and you know, your kid, you got the, you got the, you got the, yeah, you got the, <laughs> the hair brush, and, um, and he would be silently laughing at me, and I, because it probably, you know, it, it, it didn't even make sense to me back then. I didn't, I didn't know, but I, you know, I did a little bit of piano practice when I was little, but I didn't know that the rudiments. Once you know how to do something and you keep practicing, your your voice, the voice is getting higher and higher and higher mm. and lower because you need some low notes for contrast. You can't just Go straight into you know and uh, yeah, and it's all high and uh, no, you need that warm. Mm. Uh, uh, I don't, I don't. Uh, then higher, higher, higher. And you get that, you get that, um, that incremation. Is that a word? But you get that, that, that crescendo and 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 that vocal kind of explosion because you've got some low notes. Because I, you know, as well being so a little she, kid, you don't concentrate on the low notes on your little and I used to say to Nessie oh, I don't want to say no my darling you need to know the low notes and it was um she'd tell me to listen to people like Randy Crawford mm -hmm. so when I was a kid and she said let listen to Randy and I used to I used to try to hit the low notes like you do in private school right <laughs> and your head's going up and down mm -hmm. Then she would say, "No, you sing the note, and the note is on one line, and that take that took a lot of uh, you know precision and a bit of focusing 
see one line. How can it be when the notes go go like that? And um, when I was, you know, I know that my range has, has changed um, solely due to Nettie and practicing because there's some, there's a track that I sing, a Bazaar Inc. tune, and I could not sing it at the time when I met Bazaar Inc. And it's, a, it's called Play With Knives. So it's got, it's quite, you know, Nettie's friends would say it's quite strident because it goes, <laughs> it goes, yeah! into it because it came out in 91 and I met them in 1992. Mm. I just used to, even television, we did this Nomsky, Nomsky was, um, did dance energy. I just mind it because I couldn't hit those notes. But after all these years, not only can I sing that, I can sing that in, I mix that with um, with soprano. Yeah, but it's kind of, but I can do that in full chest voice if I want. And that's and that's Nettie. That's Nettie and trusting her, trusting the body and just going for it. So that, I mean, that really, I mean, you, you do talk about that training, literally. You went there to get that longevity. She's certainly given that to you, you know, because, I mean, working that way has enabled you to sing just about anything, which is amazing. Now, after that, so after the grapes and cheese, I have to explain about grapes and cheese, by the way, because Angie did mention that Nettie not only obviously gave her this fantastic uh, vocal training, but she also introduced her to the exotic things such as round cheese and grapes growing in the conservatory. But that's another story. <laughs> so you'd gone to... Sorry. Oh, it's, it's so French. Uh, and she also taught me to sing, you know, in French. Quand il me prend dans ses bras, il me... So I learned some Jacques Braille, some stuff that, look, you're a Preston kid, why, you, why do you know that? But it's just added to your um, to your culture. And um, Nettie was married to Leo Aylen. He was a, a, poet, uh, a poet, wasn't Huh? Was he a poet? He was a poet. Wow. That's, and so we used to go to these poetry evenings and we used to see people who went on to make it like Helen Lederer and um, uh, 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 Mariana Prostrop, this one, that one, Brenna, you know, all the people that went on to do jonglers. We used to see them in the, the Hampstead Theatre, the Chinese Theatre, you know, the like, you know, 70 people. And we'd go and we'd get all this. I got all lots of culture from, from Nettie. Because yeah. I think that. You know, I'd really tried French bread and garlic bread before that because you just have, we so, just have a yeah. So it's like all this kind of, all this exciting cultural, uh, you know, stimulus, uh, you know, that, that's like around you and it's all kind of going in. I mean, you certainly didn't need drama school. I mean, honestly, anyone can see. <laughs> you have enough drama in your own life. It's amazing. So now, now you, you said you... You didn't stay at, at um, drama school because you decided to go to the music. You started to join a couple of bands and you also met the, the legendary and worked with the legendary Rolling Stones, Keith Richards and Ronnie Woods. Um, yeah. Tell me about that because that, how did that happen? That's incredible. Well, you know, just to tag on to the last bit of going to Netty, yeah. well, you also gathered when I left drama school that there wasn't a lot of... Um, acting work for actresses of colour. Not like now, where they're prepared to, you know, do the pantomime thing, mix it up. You could be my mom, you could be my daughter, whatever. So you're judged on your acting ability. Back then, you know, you know it's only like, you don't look right, okay? Mm -hmm. and it wasn't, there wasn't a lot of acting work. And plus, I didn't have an equity card. So you needed to get into a professional company before you could you could get the you could get the equity card. So it was a sixty six ninety nine. It was like how about how can I audition for things when I don't have the equity? But I you know every every professional production company only had two cards to give away every year. I mean it was like a handful. So I just thought I'll do some singing at various pubs and stuff around the around the country anywhere and uh, just to just to make a name for myself. Mm. And I thought that there, you know there was no money in doing reggae because reggae out of Jamaica is much more respected than reggae here even mm. though the lovers rock jazz British reggae took off yeah. but I just no because then promoters literally was like 
yes, Angie, you sing tonight, but you don't. We don't have no money to pay you. You're like, what do you mean? <laughs> you haven't got any money to pay me. And I just thought there's no money in it. And I thought American people do so soul music really well. I'm gonna I'm gonna join a rock band where I'm gonna make a little name for myself doing the rock and from doing <laughs> from doing the dirty strangers. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because that was the that was the band the band. Well, I think you two bands weren't there, but one of them was Dirty Strangers, and what was the other band? Um, uh, so I I was with EK One as well. Gosh, so and it, it was with Dirty Strangers that you met um, Keith Richards and Ronnie Woods, wasn't it? So That's, they've got quite a, a big, um, you know, probably as far as rock and roll is concerned, because um, they um, Alan used to open for uh, the Rolling Stones and various gigs like when they played these massive places venezuela you know brazil he's been like on there doing, literally sound checking mix mic and 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 playing the guitar but i never had the opportunity of working with all four stones but i definitely uh worked with ronnie wood and 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 keith richards and and they they were friends <laughs> they were friends of, of ours they hung out with us and i was like i didn't i didn't quite get my head around it um it was before the stones went back on the road so the, all the furore around them had sort of died down and then it was only maybe i don't know five years after that they did the voodoo lounge tour and they were so back and they were so massive and i and i couldn't believe it i thought look at that look at that they they used to you know you know i said literally i'm gonna get a pen finally we just <laughs> 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 I'm play the guitar with a cigarette. You know, back then you could smoke a cigarette in the club. Oh. <laughs> and, and he had no money. I mean, I, I don't know if I'm going to get into trouble, but one one day we we had a whip round for him. I, I think he was uh, going through a divorce, and then he got married to Joe. And then you know he had to wait. Um, I guess he got one of the the uh, songwriters because he was also in um, uh, Rod Stewart's band, The Small Faces. So he, he was a wealthy man, don't get me wrong, but he probably had a cash flow problem, let's put it like that. <laughs> and he was like, guys, I've got a gig with Bo Diddley right now in the West End. I ain't got any money. <laughs> Can we have a little whip round? And everyone was like, what? We've got to put some money in the app, in a tip for, in a tip for tap for Ronnie. <laughs> but thank God. And I'm like, he's, He's well fed. What are we okay? Okay, as a fiver, you know. <laughs> but it sounds like you had some amazing time. Sounds incredible. So you then, I think you were then doing. You started doing a, a lot of open mic nights. How did those happen? What were they like? And what came from that? Uh, so that was in the mid in the mid eighties. I was with you know EK One, the Dirty Strangers, and I was just doing sessions for various people around that time. And I saw my friends. Zetia Messiah. Now Zetia, she had been on tour with Yaz, and she'd been on tour with Kylie Fisher, and she was like, oh, "It's too bad." I was like, "Oh!" And she goes, "Andy, there's a, a performance open mic night," and I said, "What is this?" Because anybody, you know, pro or semi-pro, whatever, can get up there and just jam, and you go there and you network, girl. Go there and network. And I thought. Okay, not only I'm going to network, I'm going to make that place my home. I'm going to be such a familiar face. And um, that's why when I got into calling myself Angie Brown, instead of just going, it's Angie, even now, if I had left a message for you, I'd say it's Angie Brown. Because I clocked that if you do the whole name, people thought that they'd heard of you. <laughs> well, you've got to get your name out there. And, and I think people have certainly heard of you now, Angie, for sure. Angie Brown. <laughs> it's like, you go, hi, I'm Angie Brown. And they go, oh, hi. Like, they should know. It, it, it's almost, it's, I don't know. I but don't, it shows, I, I, nevertheless, it shows that mindset that you, you, you know, although you were still incredibly young, you were already working out for yourself, how am I going to do this? How am I going to do this? The same way that your mum would think, you've got that same thing going on in your head. I've got this goal to reach and I've got to get there. How am I going to do it? And you're analysing, you're working it out, you're seeing your opportunity. And the way you're talking about it, you're not just going to turn up there and perform. You're going to go there and own the place and make it your home. So what came from that then? Well, I observed the and, um, you know, I'd be quite far down in the list because they kind of saving the best and the strongest singers for last. And you let the, the newbies on first and and um, and then, you know, maybe into the 
last hour you get all the real strong singers on and um and, that, and then some people used to get up and do a ballad i remember it so clear I mean, I, I, I don't riff like that, so I'm, 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 you know, I'm not taking the pee. I, there's a respect there for that type of singing. But <laughs> there's 10 people, they've all got up and they've all done a ballad. So they're thinking of themselves. Mm. You can do that. You have to entertain the people. So why am I getting up there and singing, you know, you know, somewhere over the rainbow, I believe the children. I can, I can arrange those songs as well, but I'm not going to get up there and hold the longest note and blah, 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 when people are not being entertained. So yeah. I used to get up there and I turned to Asha or whatever, or whoever the MD was, and I'd say, right, we're going to do uh, some Sister Sledge. And so they'd start with their bum, da, 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 da. Da, 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 da. Everyone, yeah, come on, yeah, bum, uh, 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 we are, that I'll do, we are family, I'll do uh, respect, I'll do um, young hearts run free, I'll just do anything. And change up I'm, the energy. Yeah, that's it, they're going to call me on when they need the room lifting, so I'm learning, yes. you know, Des O'Connor used to go, and blinking Prince's bad. Anybody touring at Wembley, um, Mariah, not Mar yeah, Mariah Carey's people, um, uh, Whitney Houston's band, we got tickets to sit backstage in the VIP, and it was all because I used to, I used to get my own stand innovation without doing a ballad. I just did an up tempo where people stood up and they wanted to dance. Yeah, but Angie, that is also that is also because you do have that voice and you do have that thing. I think that you know you sing, people do want to get up and dance. They do. That's that's your gift. You know, well, one of your many gifts. You know. <laughs> I just how can you bore the audience like that? They by now second hour into the show, they want to get up. They want to dance. You know, they want to. Well, that's what that is what performing is all about, isn't it? Connecting with the audience. It is. It, you know, in and, and really giving them something, which is just amazing. So now, out of the same sort of situation, Bizarre Inc., that, that kind of came out of that that setting, didn't it? Can you tell me about how the Bizarre Inc. thing happened and with the whole, I'm going to get you song? <laughs> yeah, because um, remember earlier when I was saying to you that they've got a big soul gospel vocal, mm. <clears throat> Nettie associated with being almost southern and american and putting the weight in your feet and the putting out and you know their sound isn't up here and then tick, 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 it's like yeah. oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> and it's all and they when you watch the gospel singers they they bring it down they're not bringing they're not um you know looking like they've got broomstick tucked between their bum cheeks they're like Letting that energy come down, and I just thought to myself, right, I'm going to capitalize on that, and that I'm going to make that my sound because a lot of the Brit girls weren't doing that. And what happened was, when the house music was coming about, they would take Shaka Khan or Whitney or um, the two the two ladies on on East Brainy Men, which is Martha Wash, Lolita Holloway. Yeah, you know them. Um, Black box, mm. right on time. Oh yes, yes, yes. Right you... on time. Yeah. Us Brit girls couldn't do it. We could not do it. Not for you know, we weren't brought up in the church. We don't talk like that. We talk here. American, you know, when Jocelyn's saying hello to you, you can feel the whole she goes, and you know, girl, you're my boo. And you're like, like Oh my God! These American people. They have so you were developing that sound, you, you, you know. That? And again, Nettie had been teaching you to develop that sound. So how did Bizarre Inc. hear you and get you to come and sing that song? Well, this is it. They were trying to find somebody who could do who could do that. Who was a Brit? Because you're going to save lots of money, or you're going to save yourself from being sued. Because if you take it, if you take it off the of the bootleg that was going around that the dub plate that was, there was a dub plate with all different little hooks on it and i'm gonna get you was on there i'm gonna get you yes i am gonna get my baby and it went off into a song but they would just snap it into the hook 
So they're yeah. taking like little samples of the of the songs. They, and it was originally done by Justin. So they wanted someone who could keep it as close to the original as possible because the bootleg was famous in the clubs and in the. In, so they you know, knew it. They thought this will be this will be popular because. Yeah. Everybody kind of knew it as well. The people who went clubbing knew the hook. And then, then it, you know, we we that happens all the time. We have a piece of music. It was a we, that's from that's from um, the Temptations back in the day, or or James Brown, and they've used it on a on a on a mod, modern day piece of music. So so that's what happened. They just said, "Can you sing like Justin Brown?" And I just I I I, I just I made it up. I lied, and I just yes 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 yes, of course I can. No no problem. And I said, "Good, okay. Well, it's you know, be here, at, you know." Uh, North London, it's always North London, Camden, whatever, at a certain time. And, uh, you know, we're going to pay you this and your, the points are going to be that. And, um, and you, 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 you know, you sing it to the best of your and, ability. And at the time, it was really just a quick gig for you, wasn't it, for you to go and do that song? I mean, you didn't know at, the, at that point this is going to be an absolutely humongous hit. I mean, as far as you were concerned, you were just going along just to do a little session. I think you said you thought it was a half-hour session. Pay me now, quickly, thank you very much. <laughs> and off you went. Is that yeah. right? Because I was, to be honest, well, I remember it as clear as day. I had to sing at a wedding the next day, right? And you don't want a busted voice when you're singing and doing a solo in church. And they wanted that. They want another Aretha Bradley. You're all I need to get back. You're all I need to get back. And it was like, you know, <laughs> that goes up into the rafters. You're all, you're all I need. I, I, I said, no, 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 no. I can't burn my voice out. I need to get in this session and I need to do it. And I need to do it in the next 20 minutes. I can't keep trying it and trying it because my Because it was a heck of a, a heck of a song, isn't it, to sing like that? Yeah, yeah. and you know, if you're singing by yourself with just a just a, just some one instrument accompanying you, your voice has got to sound fresh. Yeah. And I said them in the studio, I said, but, you know, I, I, I did say to them, this isn't a normal sample for me, because my 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 voice sounds a bit like literally my natural natural really little pop voice. Mm. And I, this is like you. It's like digging deep to get that sound. Oh my mm. god! Now you've been really gonna clench my buttocks and spare down to to to. Mm. And um, I said to them, "We're gonna do it. We're gonna do it." And I, you know, I listened. I applied some some drama school technique and said, "Yeah." What sounds like it's in her feet? I just did it. I put it. I had a da 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 da. Why waste your time? You know you're gonna be mine. I'm gonna get you, baby. I'm gonna get to your time. Wow. Bye bye bye. I thought I'm gonna. Got home, took the honey and lemon to be fresh for the the wedding the next day. And you thought that's done, but it turned out to be absolutely like the house music anthem of the century didn't it pretty much i mean it was just huge and you ended up on top of the pops which was just i mean that was the thing to end up on top of the pops wasn't it you know but you know but doing all of that which was absolutely incredible so i mean and then as you said the rest is history <laughs> now you know i mean you've always been like a really really positive person and i think that's come across to everyone who's listening to this a really, really positive, self-efficacious, driven person. COVID, this period of lockdown has been a really, really hard time for so many people, hasn't it? You know, but even I think during this difficult time, it's not been a time when Angie Brown's just decided to go quiet on the scene. You've still found a way to be giving back. You've still found a way to be expressing yourself musically and sharing with other people because you've been developing your DJ skills. And I have to say, one thing that Angie told me that I absolutely love, she said, it's fine for women to be DJs now, because since you can keep all your music on, on a memory stick, which will fit in your makeup bag, it works. <laughs> Tell us about the DJing, because I know that a lot of people have been really touched, haven't they? Because they've been able to hear you sharing with them, still sharing the music, sharing the love. <laughs> Tell us about that. Literally, my brother's got tens of hundreds of thousands of of um, vinyls and when he was playing out he used to put it all in a shopping trolley that he nicked from down the road you know to wheel it from the from the garage to his car it was oh so it's because of him that we got the coins <laughs> 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 and he put it 
put it through his car because it's, it's that heavy. And um, if you notice, the record is always been a <clears throat> like a bike case, but it's a heavy thing. And and then when it came to see these, it was a bit smaller, but still people had, you know, bought, like it's almost like a big folder full of CDs. Mm. Like it's now that it's on a little stick. All of it's going to be a, a flood of female DJs because of music on a stick. And it isn't just for the men anymore. It is for, you know, women are good at production, but we've not been, um, you know, we've not been heralded as high as the men, but we're, we're, we're getting there and there's no stopping a good woman. You know that you can't keep a good woman down. Well, you can't keep an Angie Brown down, that's for sure. And uh, I mean, I think the other, <laughs> the other thing about that is that, I mean, you do do your DJing with a difference because the way that you're able to... Um, do the vocal over the top, etc. I mean, that's unique. I mean, there, you know, there is only one Angie Brown. So it tries you might, all your other DJs, right? Full respect to you. But Angie Brown is Angie Brown, the DJ, because, because you can sing over the top. And also your ability to kind of share your love and knowledge of music over the years. I mean, that's, I know that a lot of people have been listening to your show, haven't they? Yeah, they have. They have. They've been listening to all of it and really enjoying um on facebook they've been enjoying what i what i do and i just kind of sing over the top like you know i play i'm gonna get you i can play the the pa copy or i can <clears throat> sing around the original so it's going why why you know you don't you know you don't you, you, you. so i just play with it i've got the mic here i've got the there. I mean, and I call it DJ PA. So you're doing a performance and you're you're playing the tune, but you know, once you've set up the next track, you've got space to play and you can sing over it, or I can play another track. Sometimes I like some DJs say that is like a no-no, but I like when there's a track on and you can still hear the vocals from another track and in the background, almost like Michael Jackson. Old the school, the proper old school style. Come on. This is, to me, that is like art. And I get really excited. Yeah! It's the mix, the mix. I celebrate the mix. Can you hear that? You can still hear, you can still hear Sean and Scott. Yeah. I, yeah, that. because I guess that kind of actually that that really is like the house music stuff because you're mixing it up. You're just, it's like an art form. Like you, you're painting a picture, but with sounds, aren't you? Yeah, creativity. You're being creative. You're being extra creative. Yes. That's what because you're because I, I've got an artistic ear I can't help it I exactly can't help exactly I, Angie I totally get that I really do honestly and I think that's I think that's really exciting for people and really uplifting and we need lots of things to uplift us at the moment now the other thing, the really exciting thing, and now we all heard a bit of it in the opening um before the interview but when we will hear the rest of it at the end but your new single higher now dj mark burroughs has said he doesn't know a single person who doesn't love this song and i have to say honestly i've got it going around in my head all the time it's an amazing song can you tell me all about the new single you know because it was with ollie ollie richards and um the label champion etc am i getting it right yeah <laughs> tell me about the song well, basically well basically like ollie, ollie Jacobs and his dad Phil have got a massive studio in um, Maida Vale um, and they have ha I think that they've got a mini hit factory going on there I mean they've written and worked with everybody from the Prodigy, Madonna, yeah. P Peter Andre, lots and lots of people and I think that Phil has always been the, the dad, the older one that he you know he can spot a good singer when he is, when he is he one you know I mean, he, can, he can just tell and well, he, you're certainly that. <laughs> he just asked me to come in. He gave me a, that phone call saying, Angie, this is your home. Come here, work with my son. He's a really good shithole producer, blah, blah, blah. So I went in and I met Ollie. And Ollie played me this piece of music that started with a dum 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 I was like, what is this? What is this sound? Oh, my God. So I'm listening to the instrumental. And I was like, Oh, you know, you want to, you want to, you want to collaborate. Great. How many people are on it? I, I get that. It question. is exciting. It's such an exciting sound. I mean, it grabs you right away, doesn't it? It literally is. It's like, like telling a story. It is. You just hear it. Honestly, and I thought to my, I really do. You know, I believe in prayer. I believe in spiritualism. And I just thought, I did say to my mum and dad, I said, Mum, Dad, you need to help me because I, 
this sounds like a monster epic tune and I need to come up with a you know it wasn't like you know when you're writing and you're in a studio you ain't got time to go home and come back a week late you've got to come up with the goods right there and then yes and what am I going to even write? And I heard, and then Ollie goes, you come in at this point. And I, I, and then I went away and just said, you know, started writing, I want to talk because I've got questions. And I just, I, it, the whole thing came to me like, like it wasn't even in my hands, if you know what I mean. Absolutely know exactly what you mean. Gosh, I, I mean, that was meant to happen totally. It's incredible. And the song, the production of it is so amazing as well because, I mean, obviously – you know, you need a fantastic singer, you need a fantastic track, but the production is so, so critical because you can lose the quality, you can lose the energy, you can lose everything about it if you don't capture that sound, um, you know, in, in, and, and well, yeah, produce it in the right way. And what I love is that your, the vibrancy of your voice is so there, it's, it's so crystal clear. The whole thing about it, it's just so compelling. It's wonderful. And it's already topping all of the charts at the moment. I mean, honestly, this is going to be huge. I mean, when those clubs open, this is just going to be massive. It's wonderful. Well, we, we, this, well there's several DJ charts that, you know, the general public will only know about the national charts. Yeah. But the DJ so be from, you know, a buzz chart, a breaker chart, this chart, that chart, to see what other DJs are playing, you know, globally or, you know, and... and um, you know, what they're playing right now, what's filling the dance floor. If, if a club artist is going to do it, it's through the clubs. It's, yeah. it's organic and it has to come up through the club. It will not cross over any other way, but we, we're not so in the your song, So your song's come out through the clubs. But as you say, those DJs at the moment, I mean, all the DJs, you're at the top of all of those charts at the moment, every single one of those. And so when, when those clubs open again, and I think actually, do you know what? Any DJs who listen to this and hear this song, get playing it because you're going to be missing something if you don't. It's amazing. It's so clear that your life's been on a, you know, on a journey. It's so clear what you give to everybody in this, in this world, the joy that you bring to people. And it's so clear how powerful this song is, that this new song is going to be absolutely huge. And aside from that, I also i am quite sure that you'll be out there with your little makeup bag doing the most amazing things with your DJing. And I can't wait to see what happens with this, um, you know, really, really soon. I know we're going to be speaking again um, soon because another string to Angie's bow is that she works alongside the top industry manager, Cassia Saylor. Um, yeah. And together they are, have been busy obviously, <laughs> with one more thing to do. They've been setting up a fantastic um, ethical management, uh, music industry management um, organisation. Um, so at some point soon, we're going to be chatting, aren't we, about sort of the ethical side of the industry. So I really look forward to that, Angie. And it's been such a privilege to explore your life story with you, to hear your story, to hear your wonderful vocals. I tell you, with higher going higher... That's a little nest egg, you know, for when I get, I'm 57, remember? So when I do retire in the next, well, I don't know, 10 years, whatever, I've got a little nest egg so I can get the male nurses in. Ooh, a little cute <laughs> <laughs> Am I going to have? I, I think I might have to put a rating on this uh, interview at this rate. <laughs> anyway, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> well so thank you so much angie and i know we'll speak soon so you take care of yourself okay <laughs> and we're gonna hear that song now okay bye Ooh. i wanna talk because i've got questions i wanna open my heart up to you so many words that never got a mention so
If you enjoyed today's interview and you'd like to hear more from Sarah Barnes Connected, then please hit the button below and subscribe to my channel. Please also visit my website www.sarahbarnesconnected.com to go and enjoy some of my blogs and to find out who I'll be speaking to next.